Okay, uh, welcome uh, to another episode of uh, Crime Pace with Bonnie Dustin. Today we're at an elevation of 1,600 feet uh, in beautiful La Marquette County, Michigan. Okay, up there in the Uper. And what I'm showing you is a giant tailing pile. Just basically hundreds of thousands of dump truck loads of uh, iron ore and slag and uh, spoilings. Uh, because this is a, one of the largest iron deposits in all of North America. And as well as some of the oldest rock. In North America, roughly a 1.9 to 2.1 billion year old uh, uh, sedimentary uh, sedimentary rock layers of uh, iron ore. Uh, you got some uh, you got some chert in there and whatnot. It's also the North Woods, okay? Which uh, you know, I see you got a lot of coniferous forest. You can see here in mid-September the uh, the trees are already changing color, getting some of those fall colors and whatnot. Now, if I lived up here, I'd probably be on prescription opiates. It does seem like it gets kind of bleak. Seems like a lot of people up here have chosen that path as well. But uh, that's kind of just rural America these days, sadly. But anyway, uh, let's not even focus on all that. We'll uh, look at some of the plants we got going on. So uh, let's keep moving along, eh? Oh, it's quite uh, it's quite beautiful out. Okay, it's, uh, but you see, it's humid. It's about maybe 60 degrees. Very nice temperature, but no hint of the. Uh, the darkness that that awaits the seven months of just the frigid darkness and a just soul despairing crushing fucking brutality of a, of a northern winter. Okay, and I just keep again I keep just looking at that tailing pile. You can see the nice where the trucks used to go, the little roads, you know. So and the other side of that tailing pile is a very deep pit, and uh, you know what they what they I guess the iron was discovered here sometime in the 1840s. You got a couple French guys. Maybe there were a couple Brits too. I don't know. You know they had a, a couple wafers up here, and their their compasses started going haywire, and uh, they noticed that's kind of weird. Dug down a little bit, uh, found the bedrock, and indeed it was uh, composed of hematite, a major source of uh, uh, iron ore. So uh, then uh, they uh, smelted it around this area for a while. Uh, it made some pig iron, but then they realized we're gonna. This is a bigger operation. We're gonna have to put on a barge. Ship it down the lake to Chicago, and uh, and whatnot. So then they, they realized they would just have to ship this ore uh, to refineries down by you know northern Indiana and Chicago and refine it there. So uh, that's what they did, and they're still producing iron here today. And uh, you know, as you might guess, it's uh, quite toxic. Okay, especially it's toxic at the source because you get all this overburden. Okay, which is basically just the rock they have to dig through to get to the bedrock. And, uh, and then that ends up polluting the aquifer. Well, you know how it goes. And then, of course, well, if you've ever been to northern Indiana, you know how uh, there's quite a few super fun sites down there by the refineries. But uh, anyway, moving right along from that, it's, it's interesting to see that uh, you got all this beautiful fall color going off, but then you still got plants uh, flowering like this uh, Monarda fistulosa. So we're just right at the edge of summer here, right at the, the fine line between uh, summer and and then the two weeks of fall they get before they plunge into the uh, frigid depths of darkness for seven or eight months. So anyway, look at this. You got a, a bunch of uh, tiny flowers clustered in this uh, a spherical head. Okay, probably looks like 80 flowers there. And this again is in a mint family, Lamiaceae. Quite a common plant. You got the uh, got the opposite leaves right there. Okay, like uh, almost all members of the Lamiaceae. And then you got the... Uh, Kind of a, a just a fancy smell of terpenes. Kind of smell. I think they used to call this a uh, bergamot, okay? Because it kind of smells like that. It kind of smells like a, you know, maybe like a thyme. Not like a mint, but you got a lot of volatiles in there still, okay? And then the uh, the individual flowers, when you get up close and look at them, are got that beautiful bilateral symmetry and uh, the stamens that are uh, exerted out of that corolla, okay? Got a couple bricks. It's a bracteate inflorescence, a, a bracteate spherical inflorescence, a cluster of flowers. <laughs> there's some fucking, there's some beautiful ore there, uh, you salty bud. I don't know why I'm talking like that. They don't even talk like that up here. Okay, I don't know why I'm talking like a fucking pirate. I just imagine, I think it's just because I imagine the brutality of winter and I'm still sensitive to it. I, just, I don't do that shit anymore. I haven't done it since I was a child. Fuck that. But uh, you do have a nice... Uh, a nice uh, example of, uh, you got some interesting quartz in there and then some sort of other uh, metallic mineral, which uh, I should know, but I don't. And, uh, of course, the, you can see the soil that it came from uh, appears to have a lot of uh, oxidized uh, iron in there, too. So, 
they got it. They got some, they got some nice rocks up here. They do. All right. No harm in taking rocks. All right. They tell you not to do it at the national parks, but I think it's fine. If you're just taking little, you know, if you're, if, as long as you're not rolling up there with the goddamn bulldozer in a flatbed, you're fine. Fucking rocks aren't alive. They don't care. What do you, what do you, what are you bummed about taking rocks for? Why are you going to shit on people for taking rocks? Little rocks, you know? Now, if it's petrified force, maybe that's a separate thing, but, you know? Well, you just, you, you take rocks so other people can't enjoy them, appreciate them? I guess that's the thinking, but most people aren't even thinking about that shit anyway. They're mostly thinking about, you know, that new truck they want, or that hot dimwit they want to bang, or, you know, how they're going to compare themselves to other people with the useless material possessions they have. So it's, you know, it's, so, you know, take all the rocks you want, you know? No one's going to miss them. Anyway, look at this guy over here, Comatis Virginiana. Ranunculaceae is the family, okay? The Apocarpus family, uh, Ranunculaceae. Each one of these little hairy bastards is in a keen. It's a uh, a single seeded fruit, and then uh, the little hairs, of course, uh, aid in the the uh, dispersal of them. See, there's a seed right there. Looks like a damn uh, truffula tree, like some sort of fucking weird Dr. Seuss thing, okay? Probably be a lot more fun. Uh, if you were on a, you know, a mass amount of cough syrup, maybe, maybe they'd start talking to you. Okay, there we go. Uh, everybody knows this guy because it gets uh, way over planted in uh, suburban uh, gardens and whatnot. Okay, especially in the Midwest. Okay, you'd be beaten to death with uh, paper birch trees. This is Betula papyrifera. Papyrifera, okay? And it's easy to confuse with another uh, plant, another uh, uh, tree around here. Uh, Populus granda dentata, which has similar looking leaves. You kind of got to get up close and uh, look, you know, look at the venation, look at the leaf texture. Okay, granda dentata, obviously, that's easy one right there. It's, you know, pretty large teeth along the outer margin and uh, lacks that uh, very distinct uh, bud as well that uh, the birches have. Almost looks like an oak bud, okay, and that's uh, might be because birches are in the same order as oaks. Okay, families betulaceae. Uh, order is uh, Fagales. And then, of course, that distinctive goddamn bark. Look at You got the paper bark right there that all the suburbanites love in front of their tract houses in the north suburbs of Chicago, right? Huh? You know, kids that grew up there, huh? Probably fucking wanted to die on the inside. Got to get, you know, can't go anywhere without a car. You just end up on pills and they say, I don't know. You know, the whole theme, I think it's the overcast skies, you know, kind of got the whole Joy Division thing going on. You know, I'm just think about a uh, opiate addiction. <laughs> I don't know. What. You gotta keep it a little dark, right? You gotta keep it a little real. The country's in a fucking opioid crisis, and anyway, all right. Well, let's keep moving on. Uh, Betula papyrifera. Okay, there you go. There's the uh, Populus uh, granda dentata seed. Okay, at first glance, you can't. You know, if you stand far back, you can't tell. Okay, but it's also got that quaking aspen kind of thing going on too, where they flutter like that. You know. It's it kind of kind of freaks you out if you're out you're walking by yourself in the woods you hear that shit moving you think something's in the bushes okay could be a tweaker could be a bear don't know anyway uh, so they got that quaking aspen thing going on same which of course quaking aspen's in the same genus that's populus tremuloides okay but then you get up close you know you could confuse it with a birch if they're young if you didn't see that paper that papery bark that the birches have but you get up close and look at the veins. The veins are, are alternating veins, okay, but they're much more widely spaced apart from each other, moving up. That's not a good example. Here you go. Here's a good example. Then a birch's, okay? It's got a different texture as well, and then a, a red stem oftentimes, okay? And, uh, I mean, you know, the difference, if, if there's no leaves, you're kind of fucked. You just got to look at the uh, the bark. But, uh, anyway, there you go. Populus granda dentata, which, of course, is in the... Uh, Salicaceae, the willow family, entirely different family from the Betulaceae, which the uh, the birches are in. You can see when they're growing. See, that's not it's not papery bark right there. So you got Populus granda dentata, and then you got a uh, Betula papyrifera. Okay, just minute differences in the leaves. Okay, and then just below the Betula, you got the, a plant from the mango family, aka the Asrash family. It's a species of Roos. It's one of the sumacs. Okay. Look at the fruits right there, okay? Okay, so, you know, same family as poison oak, but this isn't going to give you an ass rash. Well, maybe some people, if they're allergic to it, all right? This is Roos glabra, okay? So named because it's got a glabrous stem with no hair on it, okay? Which is a big uh, a big thing to pay attention to. It differentiates it uh, from the uh, closely related Roos typhina, 
Why the fuck is this thing not... Oh, you piece of shit. You know, the, the goddamn camera's not focusing. I don't know what to do. I'm about to have a breakdown, okay? This is what happens when you got too much caffeine running through. You start freaking out about stupid shit, okay? My friend Alan says he doesn't want to drink coffee because he doesn't want to be that guy at the stoplight screaming to himself, you know, at a red light, okay? It enables people to do stupid shit at uh, 10 times the rate. Anyway, so uh, as I uh, stay here... Uh, Crouching down in the bushes, talking to myself. I was saying you got a glabrous stem right there with no hair on it, okay? So w w that's an important differentiating factor between Roos glab glabra and Roos typhina, the staghorn sumac, which has a fuzzy stem. A fuzzy stem. That's why they call it the staghorn sumac. Because it kind of, you know, kind of reminds you of like a, a deer antlers. Okay, it's got kind of fuzzy and shit. Okay, pinnate foliage. And uh, it changed color real nice. They look real nice in the fall when they're losing all their leaves. Okay, and over here we got one of my favorite pines. Okay, you got the jack pine. Pinus banksiana. These uh, semi serotonous cones that stay, uh, that stay attached to the branch and then let out their tiny little uh, seeds. Okay, I always thought this was a, a fire dependent pine. I guess that some of them are. Some of them look like they stay... If they the cone, yeah, because I wait. Some of them stay closed up there, okay. See that, but then some of them just apparently just open upon maybe these are just maturing. See that that looks like a that looks really obscene. That looks like something you know somebody would leave floating in a toilet in an airport bathroom. That's uh okay, but it's woody, it's ready to go. Yeah, see, some of these stay closed, they are serotonous, some open, some are serotonous in response to fire. You need the fire, it's all gotta burn. Okay, I walk through, you know, some overgrown prairie with a bunch of nasty weeds and shit on it. You just want to light that shit up, okay? And they do do prescribed burns, but of course they're doing it, you know, they're, they're making, you know, they're taking into account the winds, checking the weather patterns and whatnot, making sure they're not going to burn, uh, burn down the entire area. But uh, you, need the, you need the fire, and it's evident in the plants there, okay? But again, if all the cones on this were serotonous, then that wouldn't be reproducing either. So it looks like... Maybe they open when the vascular, the vasculature from the branch they're on is cut off from the rest of the plant, like if a, if a branch breaks or something. Oh, quite a few. Quite a few are closed and quite a few are open. So, but as I was saying, if all the cones were closed, then it wouldn't, it'd never be reproducing unless it did get a fire. So you kind of want to, you got to, you got to walk a balance, you know. Some will stay closed waiting for a fire. Some will open uh, every year. So, I wonder if anyone studied that. I don't know. Anyway, there you go. Pinus banksiana. The jack pine. Important to note here, you got needles in a fascicle of two. Okay? Two needles per fascicle. And it's not, it wouldn't make a very good lumber tree because they don't grow that straight. Okay? The uh, balsam firs behind it are growing up straight. Abies balsamia. The balsa, balsam mariana, balsam buri. <laughs> the, I don't know what the fuck. Alright, let's keep going. But uh, anyway, the point is, yeah, it's just kind of a scraggly old bastard. Two-needled pine with the serotonous cones. Go fuck yourself. Yeah, we're not on that Midwest limestone anymore. Look at the grain sizes in these racks. Huh? I like it. Relatively large grain sizes indicating either metamorphic action or more likely, in this case, uh, intrusive igneous action. And uh, some of the oldest rocks in, uh, in North America. We're talking two billion years old. Okay? 1.8 to 2 billion years old right here. Like you got some greenstones here too, which is basically just the uh, cooked volcanic rocks. But volcanic rocks, remnant of the great rift that once existed here a billion years ago uh, from an old continental split. Well, it didn't it didn't fully split, it only partially split, but uh, you know, you get those uh, upwellings of magma, basaltic magma, but then it was cooked later on. So is that even what the fuck I'm looking at? It certainly does look like a greenstone. But anyway, moving on to the trees, you got the Pinus resinosa. Another two-needled pine, longer needles, but it's got kind of a more uh, appropriate form for any sort of human use, okay? This is uh, called the Norway pine, but it, uh, <laughs> it grows in North America. So anyway, the etymology of that. Maybe it grows in Norway too, I don't know. Only I've only seen it in a, up in the North Woods. <laughs> So there's uh, that, you got the two needles, but see how much longer they are than the Pinus uh, Banksiana. And uh, there's the cone right there, just a tiny little, tiny little bastard again. And kind of a nice bluish tint to them though, okay? But with those long needles, don't confuse them with another pine that grows up here, the Pinus strobus, the white pine, 
which uh, comprised most of the uh, building materials that burnt down in the uh, Great Chicago Fire. All this northern forest lagged, unrepentantly lagged, and then shipped down south to build all the uh, stupid shit. There you go, there's a uh, populous tremuloides. Okay, kind of almost looks like that uh, populous granda dentata, except it doesn't have the big teeth on the margins, and the leaves are a lot smaller. Okay, only about two inches, uh, two inches wide. And then, of course, yeah, you got the, the whole tremuloides thing, the fucking quaking, whatever the fuck. When they get bigger, uh, they got that nice, that beautiful white bark, but it doesn't peel like the birches. But there's some nice greenstone, basically just metamorphosed basalt, cooked basalt. Okay, but you get a lot of, uh, you get a lot of copper and silver deposits a little bit west of here in uh, fissures in the, in the, uh, the parent, the parent rock, which is this greenstone basalt. You know, some guy pulled out like a fucking 18 foot long, you know, foot and a half thick, uh, pure copper, uh, just basically a pure copper, uh, slab, uh, that was at the bottom of Lake Superior about that 10 or 20 years ago. So, so this presumably is all just dumpings, and, uh, you know, you got some really nice uh, indications of some of that, uh, that iron ore right there. I mean, this is just quartz, this is just silica, but, uh. Look at the banding right there, okay? So you got like a mixture of uh, kind of a, a silica-rich rock, maybe a jasper or something, mixing it with the hematite. But this is, I mean, this is pure iron ore. This is the good stuff. You got to cook this down, okay? <laughs> Create some slag, okay? Bring it to Indiana and, you know, turn Indiana into more of a super fun site, which uh, <laughs> most of it is already, okay? And not just, uh, not just environmentally, but spiritually as well. Got a nice member of the uh, Nephalia over there. The uh, Paper Daisy tribe. The uh, Pearly Everlasting tribe of the Asteraceae. I'll give you something Pearly Everlasting. Phyllis Margaritaceae. You can see why they call it the Paper Daisies because the, the paper phyleries, or the phyleries are so papery. Okay, just little, uh, just little uh, papery break the eight bastards, okay? The Paper Daisies are what you get in Australia. A lot of their composites they don't have much many much composite diversity in Australia or New Zealand for that matter but most of them most of what they have seem to be from the Nephalia tribe Nephalia with the G if that makes any sense G N A P H I L E A E but uh, you could see you know it does look like a composite you get close enough you see a bunch of tiny flowers in there but uh, anyway with a lot of the paper daisies these phyleries which, you know, compose the bracts, the roofing shingle bracts on the side of the involucre in most sunflowers and most composites. They, uh, the, these bracts in a paper daisy surf to act as more of a floral attractant to make that floral head, that capitulum, more attractive to pollinators. The leaves are just kind of a piss yellow right now. They're like a, like a bottle of trucker piss. They're kind of weathered, but you can see they got that nice wool on them, the woolly indumentum. I'm going to have to take this rock with me, okay? Somebody report me, okay? Quote, stealing a rack. It's nice, okay, so there's that Anaphilus margaritaceae again. Now, I think I forgot to mention about the biogeography of this plant, which is pretty interesting, is that it's native to both northern areas of the Asian continent as well as northern areas of uh, North America, okay, which is kind of odd. At lower latitudes, that would be a very odd disjunct to have. However, at higher latitudes, uh, the distance, of course, you know, due to the whole diameter of, that, of the globe thing, the, the distance between these uh, two continents course is much smaller so during periods of climatic shifts many uh, species that are circumboreal that keyword there or uh, maybe even circumpolar are uh, able to uh, traverse to shift distributions uh, easily so you know during the east scene when it was warm and i'm not saying this plant got here from the east scene but you know who the fuck knows but during areas times when it was uh, warmer it was a lot easier for a uh, species to move back and forth between asia and america Okay, because uh, the distance, again, it is much smaller between them at the higher latitudes. So it seems like an odd disjunct, but, uh, you know, when you get up higher, uh, up higher, uh, higher latitudes, it makes a little bit more sense. These really are, uh, they're quite lovely. I'll say that. They're quite lovely. And you still got, you know, the leaves haven't turned that piss yellow yet, the trucker piss yellow, that they will in a week or two because it's getting more exposure, more warmth. So, but fall is coming. The darkness in the winter is coming. Oh, that's nice. How about that? Here we go. Okay, here we go. Uh, Hypericum perforatum. Okay, weedy St. John's wort from uh, from Europe. It's not native here, but it's uh, well established. You do get a native uh, Hypericum, uh, Hypericum ellipticum, uh, but it differs from this one in that the leaves of uh, 
ellipticum don't have, if you can get up close, you can see those, see those little pale dots, those white dots on the leaves, ellipticum doesn't have those. The flower, I mean, it just, it's got a general, a much different look to it, too, if you compared it to, but uh, for starters, that's a big difference right there. See those, the dots, and then you flip those leaves over, you got the prominent veins. Okay, this is perforatum, this is the invasive one. Okay, but it's good for depression. And there's actual, uh, some pretty valid science and analysis of the chemicals that are uh, contained within that uh, that give it its medicinal properties that make you want to, uh, you know, take the uh, those uh, gel tabs of St. John's wort rectally that you might uh, get from the Walgreens over there, okay? You get a lot of this species out in uh, the forests of uh, uh, Northern California and the Pacific Northwest as well. There you go. St. John's wort. Or, you know, you don't know, a lot of plants are just called warts because it's a fucking some old English term. I, I really don't like that word. It's just it's fucking you know, and then it applies to the whole alchemy thing too. A lot of old English words wart just means I think it's from the the etymology is from the term root, but it implies a medicinal use. So it's got this old English thing. Maybe I picture some old white guy with a big schnoz and a couple, you know, some bad skin and a little hat, you know, and a, the the medieval times from, you know, mashing a bunch of shit up in a pot in a wooden shack. Is that just me? Am I just fucked up from watching? I don't know. Okay, let's keep going. I, I will say with the whole uh, medicinal plants thing, there's a lot of valid chemistry, of course. You've heard me go off on this before, but uh, it does speak a lot to the failure of the American healthcare system that uh, so many people are willing to go towards uh, things that might be snake oil uh, because they, uh, <laughs> they lack the $600 a month it costs to get on a decent insurance plan, all right? Get that uh, that dirty middleman in the middle of it. Sadly, it's probably never going to change because you got a bunch of mice that vote for cats. And, uh, you know, it's why I'll be perusing the uh, snake oil section at the organic grocers and the health food stores and doing whatever the hell else. So, you know, but I guess if you're depressed, maybe St. John's Ward will help you, but also maybe just coming to take a fucking walk out in, a, in areas like this will help you. Look at all the pinus strobus up there. All the white pines. See, very distinct uh, branching structure up there. See those long lateral branches? How about that? The culinary delights of the raw, the jardinier sandwich with a nice, uh, get some nice gravy on there. Oh, might cause mild heartburn later, but it's worth it. Oh yeah, I just seen a, I seen a truck pull up. They had a couple of goofy guys in it. Real goofy looking guys, you know. Kind of scruffy, you know. Bunch of tattoos, kind of dirty, you know. Got a bunch of, just a bunch of real goofy looking guys. Okay, and the understory of Pinus sylvestris, the scotch pine. A non-native uh, pine that's, uh, gets planted out a lot. Some nice orange bark on it, see that? They just step in a piece of dog shit. Now, as we gradually ascend this now, we're going to have to do a little crash course in some early Earth history. Some of you might be aware that the planet is roughly 4.6 billion years old, and the first life is theorized to have evolved somewhere around 3.8 billion years ago. The evidence we have for this exists in the form of a kind of fossil known as stromatolites, which are basically just alternating layers of uh, fossilized bacterial mats with layers of depositional silt. The first life was chemosynthetic, okay? Just little single-celled bastards lacking a membrane-bound nucleus. And uh, the way they got their energy was basically by metabolizing uh, inorganic materials like uh, hydrogen sulfide or carbon monoxide uh, deep in the ocean. And in doing so, they produced a shit ton of carbon dioxide gas uh, as a waste product. But about 2.4 billion years ago, a pivotal event happened in Earth's history. A type of bacteria evolved which, while still lacking any kind of membrane-bound nucleus and just being these tiny little single-celled bastards, this kind of bacteria evolved the ability to split water with the aid of light. It took in carbon dioxide and then it split water with the aid of light and in doing so produced a shit ton of free oxygen that first went into the oceans and later on into the atmosphere. And all this free oxygen becoming suddenly readily available was responsible for the creation of the rock I'm standing on right now. These are the abandoned iron formations. Hey, look, how, look how shimmery it is. Huh? It's all shimmery and silvery and nice. It's that specular hematite. Okay, that's where the actual iron is. Not in the red bands, it's just the jasper, the silicon dioxide. Okay? But indeed, it's a big shiny knob. Okay? A massive knob. 
Okay, I can say the same thing about quite a few people I know. So anyway, the thing to note about this rock, though, is it's classified as an extinct rock. It's one of Earth's few, if not Earth's only, extinct rock. And that's because the conditions that created it no longer exist on planet Earth. Those conditions being an anaerobic atmosphere, an atmosphere free of oxygen, and uh, a, an ocean that contained a ferrous iron, Fe2. Okay, now those cyanobacteria, of course, are just, you know, they're splitting carbon dioxide and water with the aid of light and they're just pumping out. They're taking in all the CO2. They're pumping out all the oxygen. They do this for, you know, however many hundreds of millions of years. And it's building up the whole time. It's building up in the oceans, building up. And uh, that ferrous iron at Fe2 is reacting with those oxygen molecules to form Fe3, which then precipitates out of water because Fe3 is not soluble in water unless it's at a very low pH, unless it's very acidic. So that Fe3 then precipitates out of the ocean, settles down onto the bottom. And uh, remember, these were all horizontal layers again, of course. And just that keeps happening, stacking up over, you know, hundreds of millions of years. So you get the, the, the hematite, you know, just layers of uh, Fe3 settling down sinking down out of the ocean, precipitating out of solution, sinking down to the bottom of the ocean, and that's covered by a layer of silicon dioxide because there's a lot of silica dissolved in the oceans as well. There still is. It's what the radiolarians build their shells out of, those uh, cute little single-celled bastards that Ernst Haeckel was so obsessed with. So you just get these alternating bands of, of hematite, the iron, and then the silicon dioxide, which also has a little bit of iron in it, that's the red color, just building up uh, very slowly over hundreds of millions of years. And eventually... All that the uh, Fe3 uh, settles down. Uh, there's that. There's no more Fe2. There's no more ferrous iron. Ferrous iron Fe2. Ferric iron Fe3. There's none of none of the ferrous iron left in the oceans. Okay. And once that happens, then that oxygen starts going into the atmosphere, rising up into the atmosphere. At which point, uh, it causes a massive extinction. But again, the, the, all, all life back then was just microbial life, so it's kind of, eh, whatever, you know. So you got to crack a couple eggs to make an omelet. No big deal. And it uh, causes a massive extinction. And also, because all that CO2 has been removed by that cyanobacteria, and CO2 is Earth's thermostat, always has been, always will be. It's the main, uh, you know, the element in the atmosphere that's uh, prone to a lot of fluctuation. Okay, water vapor actually is, you know, can... Uh, absorb a lot of heat too in the atmosphere but you know once it gets to a certain level it just rains there's only so much you can go but carbon dioxide levels can fluctuate greatly and they have through uh throughout you know the the past four billion his years of uh earth's history so once all that uh, co2 uh is pulled out of the atmosphere there's still some in there but most of it's been pulled out okay that plunges the planet into a uh into a massive uh, glaciation, okay, just basically snowball Earth, and that's an event known as the Huronian glaciation, and that lasts for a couple hundred million years too. So everything gets all fucked up by this addition of oxygen into the atmosphere, okay. But eventually, life being what it is, some uh, some of those single-celled organisms pull through. They go on to evolve into eukaryotic life, cells with the nucleus, and those go on to evolve into multicellular life. Etc. Then you get the whole Cambrian explosion thing. You get the trilobites in the ocean and the sponges and all those sick little bastards running around. Okay, the trilobites eventually go extinct in the Permian, but we won't get into that. Okay, so you got all this complex life. Now you got complex life, which wouldn't have been able to exist had that oxygen not been made available for it. Okay, to uh, to help it metabolize and respire. Okay, so now now we're working. Now we're cooking. Now we got a lot of multicellular. We not only not only have multicellular life, we got we're starting to get complex life. And then eventually, 440 million years ago, uh, you get land plants evolving, just starting out as, you know, those uh, little icky green mats on the shores of a shallow sea like Cooksonia. And, uh, you know, not very tall at all, non-vascular, not complex. And eventually those, you know, you get the lycophytes and shit, then you get the, the fucking life crows onto land. Okay, now you got, you know, fungi, you got land plants, you got the, you got the, you know, more complex organisms starting to evolve. You get the synapsids, etc. And you got the, the fucking Permian extinction, Triassic, etc. And that's how we end up here where we are today with the reality TV star president and a uh, consumer retailer society that, uh, you know, slowly makes us all want to die. But anyway, I'm just speaking for myself. But anyway, so this is a pivotal event. These are This is a hallmark. This is an emblem of a pivotal, pivotal event in Earth's history. And that's why... Uh, you know, I decided to do a video on this, on these banded iron formations, okay? Signs of the great oxygenation event 
of uh, 2.5 to 2 billion years ago. Oh yeah, that's nice. So technically what you got is a metasedimentary rock. A 2 billion year old metasedimentary rock. Meta just meaning it's been metamorphosed, it's been cooked, and that's what all these that's why they're well wavy and shit. They're not just straight. Okay? If you could have been back here when it was still fresh, maybe 1.5 billion years ago, 1.7 billion years ago, this would all be straight lines. But remember, it's had a long time to get tortured and cooked and you know compacted, sub subjected to all kinds of heat and pressure and uh, uh tension and compaction, etc. So and of course, back then, you know, the continents were all the fucking over the place. They, they came together and split up a whole bunch of times. And it was a much different planet back then. But, I mean, Jesus Christ, look at it. This, it's, a, it's a gorgeous rack. Do you like a rack? <coughs> Fuck. Do you like a rack? Makes me pray to God. Makes me pray to God that such a beautiful rack could have been placed here. To test my uh, my belief in a divine being. Oh, that's so nice. Look at that. Oh my God. You know, I mean, looking at this stuff now, I realize there's really no way to separate the hematite from the jasper from the chert. You know, so maybe that's why they didn't uh, why they didn't mine here, because they really yeah they went for everything. There's massive just uh, you know open pits uh, where they where they went. I don't think there was I don't think there's banded iron down there. I think it's just more just basically pure iron ore you know very very rich hematite you also get taconite which i believe is not so rich this is rock porn <laughs> you gotta thank cyanobacteria for everything today if it wasn't for them we wouldn't be here my obnoxious ass wouldn't be uh, ranting to you hunched over Taking pictures of racks, praying to God, asking you if you want a bag. The, the shimmery shit is really something else. Specular hematite. Maybe you got a little bit of little bits of mica in there too. And of course, the red. Uh, that red is just the, you know the the chert, the the jasper, aka the chert, which basically is just silicon dioxide, just alternating layers. Building up, building up over hundreds of millions of years, but this specular hematite is really something else. It's given the give, given the sheen to it, given the sheen to the rock here. If you look that up on a on the internet, go ahead, do, do it right now. Look it up. You'll see a bunch of crazy woo woo bullshit from uh, you know crystal worshippers and new agers and shit about the the healing properties, which of course is all nonsense. Okay, I'd like to just uh, start an online business where I sell pieces of a uh, slag. That I uh, obtained at super fun sites in Northwest Indiana, sell them online as a uh, healing uh, healing rocks. But you really do get some lovely uh, some lovely bits here. Look at this. But again, these wavy patterns. It's all you got to thank the metamorphic action for that. It's from the uh, Proterozoic. Wonder what happened here. Why is all the paint here? Either that's a bunch of bird shit or uh, somebody spray painted Slayer on the rock right there, and then someone else came along and tried to cover it up. I don't know. You know, that fucking, that yard near a sandwich is really, uh, it's really good, tearing up my insides. I think it's all the oils, maybe the, maybe the hot shit too, I don't know. Again, you can just look at that magnetite. Magnetite, hematite, silicon dioxide, the red jaspers. Anyway, I think I should probably, I'm probably going to get going now. But, uh, hopefully you enjoyed, hopefully it was as good for you as it was for me. And it was pretty good. Been wanting to come here for a long time. As someone who wants the origin story, the origin story on planet Earth, how everything came to be, this is a very important spot. Anyway, that's all I got. To, that's all I got for you today. I'm gonna go drink some water down coffee and instrument. Go fuck yourself. Have a lovely rest of your day, and uh, don't be a prick. Bye. Oh, it's so beautiful. Who could do this but God? Another species of birch over there. Oh, look, it's a, a feeded body of water, rich in both tannins and probably uh, you get some nice uh, echoing right here. You don't want to go in there. Oh, it's much cooler down here. They were they were mining here for a while, and then I think they dug down deep. You know, like the 20s and 30s, they dug down deep 
and realized that it was just the it's underlain all the banded irons are underlain by a giant pluton of granite so it's uh you know it was basically worthless which i'm glad because uh you know otherwise it wouldn't be here anymore and i'll be gone you give me five dollars if i go in there in times such as this when a country is ridden with hardship and strife uh, we have to find it on ourselves to put our hands together and uh, look from guidance from gad oh it's, it's fucking it's, there's, there's something moving in the woods over there. I can hear it. <laughs> Look at all the taconite on the ground, okay? Look at all the taconite on these train tracks. That's not the that's not the ballast. That's just taconite pellets spilling out of the ore trains. There's some good money right there, okay? We're all the tweakers in Northern Michigan. Get them out here. You could roll a 1992 beat-up Toyota pickup out here, okay? Fill it up with the taconite pellets till the chassis is about to scrape on the top of the black top, okay? And find some... Uh, some sketchy, uh, sketchy scrap metal dealer who's willing to uh, take all of it. All right, it's good money, huh? Might be what I get into, uh, you know. Once this, uh, this whole gimmick of uh, making botany videos uh, tapers off, once the, once the interest tapers off, what am I doing out here? Oh, 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 she comes over there. Oh, she's coming. She's coming around the bend. And why am I talking like a why am I talking like a pirate? Okay? And are these guys gonna call the cops on us? I fucking hope not, because we're camped out here. Okay? One of the best places to camp I've learned in my time traversing uh, throughout the United States. Can't speak much for other countries, but at least in the United States, one of the best spots to camp is uh, adjacent to railroad sidings or uh, railroad yards. And that's namely because you get a nice patch of barren soil. And, uh, you know, hopefully if they're not going to call the cops on you, you got a relatively uh, a desolate spot to hang out. Because no one hangs out in railroad yards except wing nuts, uh, homeless people, and the occasional graffiti writer. Okay? You know, I had a friend that used to work for this railroad, and then he worked for CN. Now he's a fucking manager over there. They're probably, they have no idea what I'm, I think I'm fucking out of my mind. Anyway, there go all the tech and night ore trains. My friend used to work for them, and he told me stories about just doing late night runs through the upper peninsula of Michigan, through the snow, going fucking eight hours without seeing a single soul. It's very desolate. Maybe a couple bears, maybe a lynx too. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the fire over there. 